are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Happy Monday to all of our listeners. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. We have finally made it, Rob, the first week of the 2021 regular season. We're going to be talking a lot about the upcoming matchup between the Seahawks and the Colts as we get later in the week. But today, we're going to have our usual Monday mailbag segment. And We have to discuss the cornerback situation. There's been a lot of movement at that position, a lot of turnover since the first 53-man roster came out. And so we're going to revisit where that group is at right now with just six days until the Seahawks are at Lucas Oil Stadium facing the Colts. Jam-packed episode coming your way, so let's get to it. The NFL season is about to begin, and nobody covers it like the Locked On Podcast Network. August 30th through September 8th, Locked On's Ultimate Season Preview is taking you through every team and every division with the help of Odyssey's Ross Tucker and Jason Lockefora. Follow the Ultimate Season Preview 2021 feed on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast to tune in beginning August 30th. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks. Over the past month, we have yet to see Dwayne Brown actually participate in an on-field practice. He's been staging a hold-in, seeking a new contract. And over the last week and a half, Quandre Diggs joined him with his own hold-in, though it doesn't appear necessarily that it's been trying to get a contract extension. Sounds like there may have been an insurance policy that he was trying to get finalized before returning to the field. The Seahawks got some outstanding news today with just six days until the season opener. Both Brown and Diggs were in helmet and participated in Monday's practice. And according to Pete Carroll, at least on the Brown front, I would assume Diggs as well, these guys are going to be ready to play on Sunday against the Colts. You and I have talked about it countless times. Once we reach this point, neither one of these players is going to walk away from the money they're set to earn this season. So once we got to the nitty-gritty and it was time to actually play football, no surprise that Brown and Diggs are back on the field. Yeah, but while we were certainly expecting Dwayne Brown and Quandre Diggs to return, still, it is huge news to see them actually on the field because, as you said, Corbin, we've broken down just how critical both these two players are to Seattle's chances at success in 2021. It's one of the reasons why I think that we were both so confident that Seattle was was going to be keeping extra bodies at the offensive tackle and at the safety positions because, again, until you know for sure, until you see the whites of their eyes and they're actually lining up ready to play ball, um, then they might be on your roster, but they're not on the field for you. So, um, again, that was one of the reasons why I thought that it was a good chance that the Seattle would be keeping multiple extra players along the offensive line, including the undrafted free agent Jake Curran. But, of course, course, a player like a Jake Kerr, a player like a Jamarco Jones, a Cedric Abway, they're good, solid players, but they're not multiple pro bowlers the way that Dwayne Brown is. And I'm going to focus in on him for just a moment here, Corbin, because, of course, we know that the play of number 76, that left tackle position, is absolutely critical to the play of number three at the quarterback position. Russell Wilson had talked about it publicly that he was excited to get Dwayne Brown back on the field for the Seahawks. So I think the Seahawks fans have to be just about as excited as Pete Carroll is right now. With training camp officially closed with the regular season opener here coming up and the Seahawks look like they are as healthy and as ready for the Indianapolis Colts as they possibly could be. This is a win for everybody. It's a win for the team. It's a win for the fans. And based on the reports that are out there, most recently Ian Rappaport saying that Brown and his representatives are talking to the Seahawks. They're trying to find a way to sweeten the pot for this year. No extensions on the table. The Seahawks have not changed their stance on that. They do not want to extend him in large part because he just turned 36 years old. They want to do the year-to-year thing the Rams have been doing with Whitworth. And it makes sense. You can understand why the Seahawks are being cautious in that regard. It's not that they don't want Dwayne Brown, but they're going to try to sweeten the pot. I would anticipate maybe it's one of those cases where they add a void year on for 2022 and they transfer some of the signing bonus up front to Dwayne Brown right now. They're going to find a way to get him a bonus of some sort so that he makes a little more than the $10 million he's scheduled for this year. And in that case, it would be somewhat of a win for the player, not getting an extension, but still getting more money this season in his 14th NFL season. Of course, if you consider who's been out there for the Seahawks without him in the preseason, Jamarco Jones got a few reps last preseason game. 
Before that, they were starting Stone Forsythe, the sixth round pick out of Florida. And I think Forsythe might have a bright future, but he is not ready to be playing as a starting left tackle on Sundays. And so it's great news that number 76 is going to be back. And, and I think it's equally important. Quandre Diggs, I really had no doubts that he was going to be back on the field. If either one of these guys is going to hold out into the season, I didn't anticipate it was going to happen. But Brown was the one that I thought was most likely. The fact that Diggs was participating the first week of the first three weeks of training camp really told me this was a case where he's making the statement that Pete Carroll was talking about. And ultimately it's that insurance policy. He's going to protect himself without that long-term deal being signed. This is the last year in his contract as well. Getting him back at free safety is a really big body and Marquise Blair playing back there, two capable players, but they are not the pro bowler that Quandre Diggs is really one of the most valuable players on this defense. So being able to get him and Brown back on the field for week one, this is the type of opponent you want to have both those players available. The Colts have added some new pass rushers, as we'll talk about later in the week. So you want your blindside protector in Dwayne Brown in the game. And the Colts have some intriguing weapons on the outside, assuming Carson Wentz is going to be back under center, coming back from his foot surgery. We know the physical tools are there for Carson Wentz, and he's hooking back up with Coach Frank Reich. So you got a quarterback that's more than capable. He's got some solid receiver targets, a few guys with really good speed that can be downfield threats. You want to have your free safety, the center fielder, that can take away those seam and post routes, which Quandre Dick has been so good at since they traded for him two years ago. All around outstanding news for the Seahawks. We may see a little bit more news on the Brown front if they are going to give him a bone, a few million dollars extra in signing bonus. It's possible that could come out before Sunday's opener. Seems like both sides are on the right page, as Pete Carroll today said, that everything has been taken care of that needs to be taken care of. So we'll see what that ultimately means, whether that's a little bit of a signing bonus or not. But both players should be playing on Sunday against the Colts, and that's a really big deal. That is a big deal. And then again, as you talked about with Quandre Diggs, I mean, certainly we, we all know what a huge play, uh, a huge impact that Jamal Adams made at the strong safety position. But you made the argument, and I thought very well in a couple of weeks ago, Corbin, that uh, you know the free safety position in Pete Carroll's scheme is actually even more critical strong safety. So again, we, we've talked about this, that the Quandre Diggs is absolutely indispensable to Seattle's defense, especially considering the turnover that they've had at the cornerback position. So that we're going to be talking about a little bit more. So, yeah, just the same way that it is absolutely huge for Dwayne Brown to be turning, re, returning to the offensive line for the Seahawks, it's the same kind of thing for Quandre Diggs, basically as the leader in the back half of that secondary. Again, as dynamic of a player as Jamal Adams is, most of his plays, of course, are closer to the line of scrimmage. And given the arm strength that Carson Wentz has, and the fact that I think that this could be a really interesting game, and, and the Colts are going to be eager to show off uh, uh, the, the little bit different type of skill set that Carson Wentz has in comparison, say, to, uh, you know, Phil Rivers a year ago, then I, I think that they are going to try to e exploit Seattle's issues in the secondary, and you know they're going to try and run the football. And that's the thing. is Quandre Diggs, as good as he is in coverage, he is also a physical defender, a good open field tackler. So um, while I'm intrigued by the young talent Seattle is building along the offensive line, and in the defensive backfield, there is no question the Seahawks are a significantly better squad when they have Dwayne Brown and Quandre Diggs in their normal spots. Yeah, this team's going to be close to full strength now going into this opener, assuming that both those guys indeed are going to be starting at tackle and free safety. Colby Parkinson's going to be out at least for a few more weeks, and they won't have rookie corner Trey Brown. But otherwise, this is a pretty healthy squad going in week one, having that extra week between preseason game. Uh, preseason finale and week one also was helpful as well but they should be at full strength for the most part and that's outstanding news as they look to get off to another hot start in 2021 when we return in the second quarter as we do every monday we're going to tackle your listener questions in our monday mailbag segment you're listening to the locked on seahawks podcast part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Football season is back. Let's make the most of it with a better way to create your own custom pool at runyourpool.com, the premier sports pool hosting service. Run Your Pool makes it ridiculously easy to run a football pool with friends, family, or office mates. They offer dozens of formats, including Survivor, Pick'em, Squares, Margin, Confidence Pools, 33, and more. Run Your Pool hosts formats for NFL and college football with one-week games, full season, playoffs, or even the Super Bowl. And unlike other fantasy sports platforms, 
Run Your Pool has options and settings to make it your own. You can even brand your pool for a local business, bar, or restaurant, reconnect with friends, and join nearly 2 million football fans to make every game action-packed this season. Check them out today and get $10 off at runyourpool.com slash locked on or use the promo code locked on at checkout. Anywhere, everywhere in the world, Run Your Pool helps friends and colleagues compete. The NFL season starts September 9th. Start today at runyourpool.com slash locked on. It's that time of year again, and all eyes are now turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron to start the football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all of the updated odds, props, and contests, including online's biggest half million dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest two hundred thousand dollar NFL survivor contest open on open now at Bet Online. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus. Be sure to take advantage of their opening day super promo. Make a bet on the Thursday, September 9th season opener between the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers and the Dallas Cowboys. And if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25 for new customers only when signing up and using promo code NFL100. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports from football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Monday edition, the first Monday edition of the regular season. The Seahawks will be facing the Colts at Lucas Oil Stadium on Sunday to kick off the season. We can't wait. I'm your host, Corbin Smith, as always, joined by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. It's time for our Monday mailbag segment. We got tons of questions. I would argue, Rob, this is the most questions that we have ever gotten for a mailbag segment. I had 71 of them sent to me on Twitter alone today. We don't have time to tackle all of those questions, but the good news is there was some overlap with a number of topics, so we're going to try to get as many in as we can. We're going to start, Rob, with the first question going to you from Shiv Ramdas tweets. Considering he's now in his fourth year ever as a corner, do you think Trey Flowers starting should be welcomed rather than derided? Could this not be the step forward and the development fans wanted to see from the cornerback room? I absolutely think that this is a, uh, you know, th this is a position of concern for the Seahawks, but one of the players that is actually a known commodity, of course, is Trey Flowers. As a, you know, as a listener just mentioned, this is his fourth season as a starter for the Seahawks, and obviously he made that transition from the safety to the cornerback position, but but Pete Carroll has been absolutely effusive in his praise. Uh, every, everything that we have seen in training camp and then uh, during the preseason games where Trey Flowers was not very targeted, uh, targeted very often, that's my biggest concern, but there's a reason, of course, why he's not being targeted. And so you, you see the length you know the physicality with Trey Flowers I know that there are certain receivers out there who are just so shifty that they're going to give a long limb corner like Trey Flowers some struggles that's why I think the Seahawks were wise to make some of the moves that they've made but I do absolutely believe that Trey Flowers is one of the strengths of Seattle's cornerback uh, cornerback room not one of the weaknesses even though it seems like he is a very popular uh, you know person to blame from a lot of Seahawks fans. Next question here coming from Kurt the Dirt tweets, curious how the Seahawks plan to use D. Eskridge. Will he be a Swiss Army knife catching balls within five yards of the line of scrimmage of line of scrimmage or a traditional slot? Yes, maybe a little bit of everything. I I don't know that I would call D. Eskridge a traditional slot just because we're talking about a player that has 4.38 40-yard dash speed, and I would make the argument he's faster in pads. A couple of the big plays that he had to close out training camp on vertical throws, you could see the ability to separate and then turn on the afterburners after the catch. And so they are going to have opportunities to get the ball downfield to this kid along with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. But you mentioned the getting the ball to him quick near the line of scrimmage. That's the other thing that he brings this offense that they simply did not have last year. He's that receiver that you can dump the football off to on bubble screens, reverses, different type of stuff where you can get him the football quickly and just let him go to work with that short, that short squatty frame, the ability to break tackles, to just blow by linebackers and safeties at the second level. 
it does add another dimension. And, and we've seen a few of those screens on the practice field, and they've worked out pretty well. So you've got a guy with a former running back background in Eskridge going back to his high school days. He's returned kicks and punts. Just a very versatile player. So I wouldn't call him a traditional slot. There may be times that he looks like that, but you can just do a lot of other things with him because he's a very special athlete that is capable of doing a lot of different things with the football in his hand. So I'm expecting to see a lot of different things with him in this offense. Shane Waldron's going to have a lot of fun mixing him into this offensive unit with Metcalf and Lockett, a dynamic trio that could potentially be one of the best in the NFL pretty quickly if Eskridge is able to build off the strong finish that he had to training camp and the preseason. And I absolutely love the name of this listener. He sends us questions all the time. Another fat guy tweets, should we pursue newly cut Tanner Muse, a third round safety slash linebacker out of Clemson that was cut by the Raiders? You might have seen this today, Rob, but the Raiders had pre-scheduled a tweet for Tanner Muse's birthday. And that tweet was posted, I believe, right after the news broke that they were releasing him. And this was just a big surprise anyway, because he was getting a lot of snaps at linebacker. And this is the downside in Oakland's linebacker room and Las Vegas's linebacker room. Tanner Muse now has to deal with the fact that KJ Wright has been signed. Somebody had to go. It ended up being him. Yeah, that's the thing. Is I, I think that Tanner Muse actually would make some sense for the Seahawks in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, obviously linebacker position has been one that we've talked about so much. It has some depth concerns. Are you talking about a young player who was a star at Clemson, not national title winner? Um, has a great deal of special teams experience. He's a terrific athlete. Uh, you know, roughly 6'3", 230 pounds, played safety as you know, kind of a hybrid safety role, similar to the role that, that Cody Barton played early in his career at the University of Utah. At the same time, I would argue that the the Las Vegas Raiders were still in need of of speed uh, in in their in the back seven of their defense, even with the sign uh, of the great KJ Wright. And, and so I was surprised that the Raiders are cutting bait this early on Tanner Muse. Um, it was only a couple of years ago. Uh, that he was a, a third-round selection. So because of that, I have a little bit of concern, but I think the Seahawks and John Schneider are always going to at least do their due diligence, kick the tires, and see what's going on. Next question coming from Chuck Warner tweets, how did center and corner become such weaknesses on a team that prides itself on drafting free agents and always competing? That's a really good question that I don't know that I necessarily have one answer that I can pinpoint. I I've talked about this for months, and Rob can attest to this. I still don't understand what the game plan was at center, at least in the cornerback spot. Akella Witherspoon looked like he was going to be the ideal fit, and Pete Carroll mentioned in his press conference today, it just it just didn't work out. It was not the player they anticipated in a couple other teams, not just Pittsburgh. There were a number of teams that expressed interest in trading for him. At that point, the Seahawks knew he's not going to be starting for us. Let's save some money. Let's move on just didn't offer the physicality that they were hoping that he would on the outside and too much cushion as a cover guy. And so adding those things up, they just felt like other players stepped up more to the occasion during the competition. So, you know, you can make the argument, maybe the always compete phrase isn't holding up at every position, but I think you can say, and we'll talk about this more in the third quarter. I think it did hold up at the cornerback position, just maybe not for the reasons fans were hoping for, because a lot of the players, they're really underwhelmed compared to, expectations. So I think it's two totally different situations. Corner, they went out and they got some players. It just didn't work out the way that they were hoping it would. Meanwhile, at center, that one we can all sit here and question. And if Kyle Fuller goes out and plays well, then a lot of us can zip our mouths and just move forward. But the choice not to sign anybody in free agency or draft one of those uh, young centers that was available in the second round and picking D. Eskridge instead, that might be something a year or two from now we look at like, man, what a mistake that that was. So you got to wonder about that strategy, but they had limited draft picks. They were hamstrung in a lot of different ways. And so I don't know this necessarily is a, is a situation where the front office should be scalded for both these situations, but obviously not ideal to have those two spots still be glaring holes going into the regular season. Rain tweets, with all the roster turnover on defense, who are you most confident will become a franchise defensive staple? So I'm assuming this means a guy that's not already a staple like Bobby Wagner Adams, Diggs, who's another player that maybe hasn't reached that point that you believe on defense now can, Rob? 
Yeah, I'm happy that you mentioned it because I feel like Seattle already has several defensive staples, but of course they're veteran players. Jamal Adams being the youngest one of that bunch, and obviously the fact that they, he received the contract that he did, had the, the, the spectacular initial season in Seattle that he did, then let's just eliminate him from the conversation. To me, there is absolutely one player that must be mentioned and that's Jordan Brooks. I really think that this kid is about ready to explode. I think that he and Bobby Wagner are going to basically be 1A and 1B in terms of leading the Seahawks in tackles, quite possibly both being Pro Bowl kind of defenders. I think that it's, it's a testament to their talent. It's also a testament to the scheme. I really think it's going to funnel a lot of action uh, towards those two linebackers, and you are going to see Jordan Brooks, I believe, take his game to a whole other level. Next question here coming from Kale Tweets. Just a fun little thought experiment. What if we never dealt Max Unger in a first-round pick to the Saints for Jimmy Graham and decided to re-sign Byron Maxwell to be opposite of an in-his-prime Richard Sherman? I love questions like this, even this time of year when we're far away from the offseason. And it's always fun to sit back and think, what if? On this particular one, though, you know, maybe you could make separate arguments here. Maybe trading for Jimmy Graham wasn't the right move. And, Rob, we've talked about this a number of times. And, I, you know, you look at the numbers, the numbers were great, but you were trying to fit a square peg into a round hole in a lot of different ways. So maybe you can argue that that trade in hindsight shouldn't have been done. Unger ended up having a couple more good years in New Orleans before he retired a few years ago. So they could have kept him in the starting lineup and moved forward the tight ends that they had. And who knows what ends up playing out. Graham did give them good production, a couple of Pro Bowls. The Byron Maxwell situation, though, they were going to have to pay a ton of money to be able to keep him. And they already had a bunch of big money guys in the secondary end. I was skeptical about Byron Maxwell being able to maintain his play from the previous two seasons when he was somewhat of a spot starter. I was skeptical of it when he left for Philadelphia. We saw how things played out. When he returned to Seattle a few years later, he gave him a boost with injuries, including Richard Sherman being out, provided some familiarity and did a nice job. But he didn't play another down in the league after that year. And so I don't think it would have made much sense for them to spend a lot of money. You can question the Graham trade, but I don't think you can question – Letting go of letting go of Byron Maxwell in the secondary. I think that move ended up working out just fine for the Seahawks. Last question here, real quick, to wrap up our mailbag. License to Will tweets: Which one of these new Seahawks cornerbacks, Sidney Jones, Nigel Warrior, or Bless Austin, who by the way is not on the roster yet, so maybe we don't even want to consider him yet for this question? Do you think will have the biggest impact this season? So really, Rob. This really boils down to the guys on the roster. I don't think you can include Bless Austin unless you're convinced that that move is going to happen. I'm not sure now with Tyler Mabry being promoted to 53. They don't have a roster spot open, and it's almost Tuesday, so we're getting closer to week one. It is, and I did take a, a you know couple hours from my day yesterday and watch some tape on Bless Austin. Uh, you know, it was a report from Dave Wyman, a, a buddy of mine, and I think one of the better, most uh, connected people in this uh, when it comes to the Seahawks. Obviously, uh, you know, one of the voices uh, and images uh, of the Seahawks and former player, of course, uh, as well. So I, I believe that this is a move that may happen. So I did watch Austin. I am very intrigued, but I'm going to switch back and say Sidney Jones. I, I just see that this is a a player who has the man-to-man -man skills that I'm looking for. I think Austin also has those. Uh, I, I like the length from, from both players. Um, but Sidney Jones, to me, if he can stay healthy, which, of course, has been one of the concerns about Austin as well, if they can stay healthy, Corbin, I think that these are exactly the type of pure man-to-man -man corners, not the, always the, the long, lengthy physical guys, but the pure cover corners that Seattle's roster has been missing. We talked about before with Trey Flowers. I think they already have some big body guys, the guys that Pete Carroll loves that will come up and run support. I don't see the short quick guys that can handle the two, two Atwells, the, the Dwayne Eskridge's, the Rondale Moore's, the, the guys, the, the short, quick receivers, they're absolutely taking the NFL by storm. And so I do think that Seattle has brought in some bodies there at that position that allows them to mix, to mix up and match up a little bit better than they previously could. Yeah, this is a perfect segue for us going into the third quarter because I'm sure we'll be talking about all of these players, including possibly Austin, with the idea that he may be added before this week gets over with. I would assume it would have to be by Wednesday just to get him on the roster, and I would assume he would not play in week one because he got to get him up to speed. But I got to go with Jones, too, as we've talked about since that trade happened last week. We know the talent is there. This is a guy that was a first-round pick 
before he ended up injuring his Achilles. And he has shown flashes of that talent when he has been healthy. That has continued to be the thing that has dogged him the most, just being unavailable. So they need him to be healthy, but he's got the athleticism, the ability to defend in and out of breaks. He's got ball skills for days. He's played in a similar scheme, being coached up by Jimmy Lake at Washington. He's got all that stuff working for him. I just don't know enough about these other two players. I think that Nigel Warrior offers some intrigue based on what I've seen on film. But again, he hasn't been playing corner very long. He's a former safety. I just look at Sidney Jones' skill set and the fact this guy had first round pedigree ended up getting drafted in the second round because of his injury coming out of school. But I just think he's the one that has the most talent and is the best scheme fit, has the best chance to be able to play snaps for the Seahawks right away. When we come back in the third quarter, we're going to stick at that cornerback group because if you've been hiding under a rock, maybe you haven't noticed this, but things have really changed over the last week in Seattle secondary. They have gotten rid of most of the corners that were here for training camp and they've brought in a bunch of new players. So we're going to look at that situation. A position was a question mark, remains a question mark heading into the season opener against the Colts. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite show, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle, and it's a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream and brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before. So you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part? There's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at DirecTV.com. That's DirecTV.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Did you know the Bilt Bar has nine delicious flavors, plus the occasional limited time flavor? When you talk to a Bilt Bar fan, they're definitely passionate about their favorites. If you don't know the Bilt Bar flavors, you're missing out. Whether it's cherry, raspberry, mint brownie, or my personal favorite peanut butter brownie, which I have to have before every time I go out and lift weights or jog. There's something for everyone. If you haven't tried all the flavors, you can get a mixed box where you'll get two of each of the nine flavors. And most of the flavors have 17 grams of protein, only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, and only four grams net carbs. So you're looking at a protein bar that's not just delicious, but also healthy. A couple of the other flavors have 18 grams of protein and just 180 calories. Nine amazing flavors, all tasty and all healthy. Order today and get raspberry or mint brownie, whatever flavor you like. Go to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your first order. Use the promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me for our first Monday episode of the regular season, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Going into training camp at the end of July, we talked about this ad nauseum over and over again, that one of the biggest question marks for the Seahawks, arguably the biggest question mark on the roster, was the cornerback position. Shaquille Griffin leaves in free agency. Quentin Dunbar leaves in free agency. They sign Akella Witherspoon as the potential replacement. They draft Trey Brown in the fourth round. They bring back Pierre Desir and Demarius Randles move back from safety to corner. Pete Carroll was just giddy going into training camp. If you go all the way back to mini camp in June, talking about this competition, and this was the thing that stuck to me at the time, is he said that he anticipated that this was going to go all the way up to the end of training camp, trying to figure out who the two starters are. We are now six days away from the regular season opener, and yes, DJ Reed and Trey Flowers have basically been named the starters at this point, with Akella Witherspoon being traded to the Steelers last Friday. They won those positions by default more than anything. I mean, Reed was out most of training camp with a groin injury. Trey Flowers had some good practices, but was up and down in the preseason. But nobody else stepped up to the plate. I think it is safe to say when we look at this cornerback competition, I hate using the words utter failure, but that is exactly what it looks like to me because I don't know about you, but they clearly have not figured this out. If you look at all the moves they have made over the last week, the last two weeks, bringing in John Reed, Sidney Jones with trades, signing Nigel Warrior as a waiver claim, and potentially bringing in Bless Austin now, 
this is a corner room that's been completely reinvented with a week to go until the season opener. I don't think you can sit here and say they have figured this out. No, I don't know if they have figured it out. I, I think that uh, you know they, they they entered this process hoping to get more turnovers at the cornerback position, and all they've got is turnover at the cornerback <laughs> position. You know, they that it's not generating the, the picks and things. They just had new bodies. And uh, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. It, it, from my opinion, the two best cornerbacks on the roster are Trey Flowers and DJ Reed. As far as the guys that you know fit your system. As excited as I'm about Sidney Jones, I do think that he is ultimately going to wind up becoming a starter. It is going to take a little bit of time. Should they be able to have a guy like a, a Nigel Warrior or, again, Bless Austin winds up being on this roster, as I expect it will ultimately happen. I just think it's going to take some time for them to make that transition to understanding the defense. But all of that said, the quarterback position is kind of interesting. To me, it's a little bit like middle linebacker and running back. I think those are some of the easier positions for a player to come in and be able to make an impact because it's not as much, at least in my opinion, it's not as much the mental game as maybe some of the other positions, especially cornerback. Either you can run and you can cover and you can tackle or you cannot. And I do believe that all the corners that are on Seattle's roster can do all of those different things. And again, I really was impressed by what I saw from DJ Reed way back in his Kansas State days and certainly in San Francisco. And you can go back and listen, of course, and Corbin, you and I talked about how excited we were when Seattle was able to basically steal DJ Reed from the 49ers. And I talked about before, I remain a big fan of Trey Flowers and certainly, certainly am a big fan of Sidney Jones. But I, I also think that that sometimes we get so focused in on the one-on-one -on -one battles with corners and receivers, and we don't really uh, you know, look at the entire defense as a whole. And I just firmly believe that when you have Seattle's true pass rush and Seattle's two Pro Bowl safeties in the backfield or, you know, protecting these corners that I don't think that you're going to have nearly as many concerns as what we saw in the first half of last season. I expect Seattle's defense to play at a very high level, similar to what they played in the second half of last season. So I think you make some really good points, and I want to expand off those before I start going down another road because I'm going to go down this other road. I, I kind of wrote an article this morning that was a little bit scathing of the situation. So you look at where the Seahawks are at right now, as you mentioned, this is a position where they have one player that I think can be an every game starter, and that's DJ Reed. What we saw at the end of last year, him playing on the left side now, I think he can handle that. Trey Flowers has been so inconsistent. When he's been good, he's looked like he could potentially be a long-term starter, but he's not been able to bottle it up and, and play that way for an extended period of time. So I'm still a bit skeptical there. I think Sidney Jones is going to have a great chance to move into the starting lineup if he gets acclimated quickly and, of course, can stay healthy. But my real issue here, there are a lot of silver linings you can look at. You can say, hey, John Schneider didn't let what happened with the pass rush the last couple of years materialize where they had to make a big trade at midseason and just moved on from somebody that didn't work out. He did that with Akella Witherspoon. You knew he wasn't going to be what you thought he was going to be, so you move on. I'll give Carol and Schneider a little bit of credit with that. At least they realized, look, the signing was a mistake. He didn't pan out. Let's move on. We can get a fifth round pick for him. All good. The other silver lining here is you got some young guys that could have some upside, like Nigel Warrior, that's got some good game film in the preseason with the Baltimore Ravens, who have a very good cornerback group, which is part of the reason he didn't make that team. So there are positives here. My problem is the timing of this more than anything. And just looking at this group, you had so many question marks about this cornerback group, really wondering is there a surefire long term starter in this group? They had a number of guys that had started a bunch of games with Pierre Desir and Demarius Randall being there. Now they've got Trey Flowers, and really that's it. I mean, DJ Reed has started a handful of games. The rest of the guys that are on their depth chart, Sidney Jones hasn't started that many games because he's been hurt. Nigel Warriors never dressed for an NFL game. John Reed is on the practice squad. If he gets moved up, he's played one season in the league, doesn't have a lot of snaps under his belt. So they went from wondering, do we have a surefire starter, to wondering, do we have a surefire starter, and do we have enough guys that have enough experience? So I think they exacerbated a problem here. They tried to use Akella Witherspoon as a really expensive $4 million duct tape to put over a leaky pipe. And now that pipe's about to explode and they're putting even cheaper duct tape on top of it. Now, maybe it's one of those cases cheaper ends up being better, but 
you're doing this literally a week before the start of the regular season. So I absolutely think that this is a cornerback competition meltdown that could impact the rest of this defense because you are putting a lot of things in your basket for players that, quite frankly, are new to your scheme and haven't played very much football. And a couple of them are guys that were undrafted players. So I just – maybe it ends up working out. Pete Carroll's still very excited about this group. I, I think there's just a lot of reason to pause and be like, whoa, this is not ideal going into the start of the regular season. Oh, I certainly would agree. It's not ideal. And, and I think that there's plenty of, of reason to question the decisions that the Seahawks have made. Uh, I think as, as one of our listeners mentioned earlier, I mean, cornerback and center have been the two positions we talked about, you know, the entire off season. So yeah, if, if their goal was to have basically a depth chart that was completely locked out entering the season, then yes, they failed in that goal. But I'm just not so certain that that was their goal. As we talked about a week or two ago, and you used the phrase, and I loved it, I was arguing that I think that Seattle may want to consider trying to find a whole bunch of different corners that can kind of match up with the, the variety of receivers. And you termed it a cornerback committee because we hear about the, the running back committee approach that so often. But I almost wonder if that's not what the Seahawks are considering. And interestingly enough, there was a question today about Marquise Blair, Ugo Amadi. I know it's a nickel spot and free safety and, you know, and they're, they're two very versatile players. But, you know, Pete Carroll kind of talked about that, that he – you know, may want to be able to use both of those players and kind of match them up, or at least that's what I got out of his, uh, his comments. I think that the outside cornerbacks are the exact same way. I think the Seahawks would love to have two Pro Bowl corners. They just don't have them. They've got uh, some bodies that have some intriguing talent. They've got a, co uh, a head coach, of course, in, in, in Pete Carroll, whose track record at the defensive backfield is as good as it is in the NFL. And that is the biggest reason why I still have a great deal of confidence. And this is going to work out just fine for the Seahawks. They may not have a guy who's going to be you know, one of the leaders in the league in terms of interceptions or even in minutes. I think they're going to have four or five or six corners that's going to give them a little bit more flexibility than some other teams have. Are they going to get beat at times? Of course. That's the position but i also think it gives them a lot more flexibility than some other clubs who are going to be only playing one or two guys especially in a covid year especially when you have these concerns about are these guys going to be as reliable whatever if you have five or six guys that you know have played some meaningful time for you i think you feel a lot better when you're going to nickel and dime situations down the season as the season progresses I've been such a pessimist during most of this segment, and so I'm going to finish up with one more positive here. And this is just based on what Akella Witherspoon comment, uh, the comments that Carol made about Akella Witherspoon today, and the fact that he was talking about trying to fit players into the scheme, and while still appreciating their individual skill sets, you just got to believe that Witherspoon. That's part of the reason that things didn't go as planned. He just he didn't fit into what they wanted. He didn't play the way that they thought he was going to. If some of these young players can come in and immediately they buy into your scheme and they're just better system fits, then you automatically are in a better situation than what you were with a player that might have more talent, but ultimately was not a scheme fit or was not fitting in system-wise, technique-wise with what Pete Carroll and company were wanting. And so that'll be my last silver lining here is that if some of those young guys do pick up the scheme and the technique really fast and they buy in, then you already are one step ahead. It's just... Like I said, you had a lot of question marks of this position. And now the biggest question for me is, is your pass rush going to be good enough to mask up that secondary? Because maybe DJ Reed and Trey Flowers and the starters are good enough to get by. I could see that being the case, but you better hope they stay healthy. Because if you've got injuries with the depth that they've got, especially with some of the guys behind them having past injury issues like Sidney Jones, it just seems like they have put themselves in a very difficult position to succeed with that position group. So we'll see how it plays out. They've got some young guys that offer some intrigue, just don't really have the experience and haven't played very much NFL football. They don't have the surefire starter. I think there's plenty of reason for fans to be a little bit skeptical about what this group looks like, but maybe they'll prove everybody wrong. And of course, they've got the right coaching staff with Pete Carroll and company to bring out the best in those players, especially if they buy in. Betting on the NFL doesn't have to be a guessing game if you listen to the new Locked On Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Get your daily picks, blowout specials, wrong team favored picks, and Lee Sterling's lock of the day. Follow the Locked On Bets podcast 
brought to you by betonline.ag, wherever you get podcasts. When we come back for our Tuesday episode, we're bringing back Throwback Tuesday. We're going to look back at the last couple of times that the Seahawks and the Colts faced off. Again, being out-of-conference rivals, they only play every four years. So we're going to look back at those last couple of games that these two teams played against each other. And we're going to start pulling back the curtain a little bit and checking out Seattle's Week 1 opponent, the Colts have a lot of talent. The biggest question mark is which players will be available in the season opener. They've been hit by injuries pretty hard during training camp and the preseason. We'll start looking at that Colts squad closely as we continue to draw closer to the season opener on Sunday. As always, thanks for listening in. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. Go Hawks.